All right, so that analysis for Velky theory. Okay, and 25, we are going to do uh, statistics. So here is, uh, imagine you're doing an experiment in the wind tunnel or something, and you're measuring the, the drag force, huh? or you're assembling the temperature outside. So the number would come like this, 89, 77, 88. Those numbers will have a minimum, will have a max. Huh? So if the first thing to plot those data is to rearrange them, to sort them, to start from the minimum 77 and to finish with max, max 99. And then, graphically, or to put it in tables, you would basically put them into bins. Huh? You put them into bins. You basically decide that, so the range starts from 77 to 99. So maybe I should basically make bins 75 to 80, 80 to 85, 85 to huh? 90, 90, 95, 95 to 100. And then that's it. I'm going to stop at 100 because there's no point. And each one of those pins that cover a range, right? The first pin is collecting anything from 75 to 80. Anything that land between 75 and 80 will be in that pin. That's why C77 is writing it like this. 77, 78, 79. And then coming the second pin, which extend all the way from 80 to 85. Uh, you, will, you will have 81. He got another 81. He got 82, he got 83, 83. I guess that's one way to write numbers. So what's nice is that if you can make Excel actually start sorting those data for you. When I was doing my experiments, when I was a graduate student, you know, I would sample a lot of things, and I would like them to fall immediately into slots, right? So y it's very easy to make Excel basically as you enter the number, just sort the input, huh? you will immediately put them into, into bins. And he will plot this for you. So you will start seeing that frequency distribution. Huh? How many in each pen? All right? So this is actually more useful when you think about it than just a bunch of numbers. Sorting them is even useful than unsorted, because at least you know the minimum and the max. Right? And then even putting them into pen, that's really useful. OK? So one time, and that was a graduate student, I be, we had this some kind of graph like this, and I said, well, let's find the average. So that student came and average 70, added 77 plus 82 plus 87 plus 92 plus 97, and divided over 5. Is that correct? Of course not. You can do this with those guys, yes. You can add all those. huh? and divide over the number. Yes, that would be the average. But once they are in pins, you don't treat them equally. The pin with like two or three data points is different from the pin with huh, a lot of data points. So we'll see how we can calculate the average once you have this graph. Okay. So this is if you have the raw data, not the pins. If you just had the raw data, x1 all the way to xn, you basically add. Right? And you divide over n. Right. Correct? And that, that would be your average. Right? And the standard deviation, that basically represents how far we are from that average. Is the data is all, you know, 77, 77, 77, 77. And therefore, the average is really 77. Or we just basically have uh, 40 and 100. 40 and 100, 40 and 100. And then when we average them, when we add all those 40s and 100, we end up getting 70. But 70 is not really a good representation of population, right? So you imagine, you know, in Tulsa we had one guy who has $7 billion and everyone else is making uh, 50000 per year. And then you do the average, and like, wow, the average income is like 200000 No, it's not. It's, right? It's, so that's why the standard deviation is really important, to, s to see how much is the data scattered around that average. And so most of the calculator basically actually do that standard deviation. You know, if you just give, feed him the data points okay, one by one, he will give you the average and the standard deviation. So make sure you, you see it in your calculator. Um, in some formulas for standard deviation, I've seen it over n and then sometimes n minus 1. Correct. 
and so Jason is saying there is n minus 1 and there is n. Let's look at the formula first and then answer that question. So the formula for this is not the standard deviation. The standard deviation is s. So s squared is the standard deviation squared. We call this the variance. All right? So if I ask you for the standard deviation and you give me the variance, you'll get 4 out of 5 because I ask for the standard deviation, not the variance. So remember to make sure what I'm asking for is the variance or the standard deviation. So the formula is x minus x average, the whole thing square. So x, that's, those are the data points. That's the 4 and the 7 and the 10 and every one of them minus the, minus the average and you are squaring. So you are squaring so that if the error is plus or minus, doesn't get canceled with each other and then you end up with like zero variance. Wow, look, the average is excellent. No, it's not excellent. Huh? It just you have 40 and 100, 40 and 100, 40 and 100. So that's why we square it, all right? And then after we square it, we divide over the, over now what? So Jason question is that some formula, and actually in your calculator, even you will see sigma n and sigma n minus 1. In this course, we'll use n minus 1. And the reason why we're using is n minus 1 is because already in the variance, we kind of pivoted the data around x average. So it's kind of, we lost one degree freedom. So when we were trying to come up with x average, we divide over n. But when we try to come up with s square, we divide over n minus 1. Because kind of, we now already don't really have an kind of n points. We have n minus 1 because we already kind of secured the average in the middle. So if you have a known population mean So in, in this course we will always use n minus one. Why why do why is it n sometimes in other books? I think it's because the the way they treat this uh, using the degree freedom thing. I don't really know the what's the mathematical uh, significance of it. More than basically you know, this is how we're going to lose one degree freedom by basically already defining average before it. You cannot do this S square without knowing X bar, right? So, all right. So, here is an example, all right? So, basically, with those data points, he calculated the average, and you can check your calculator just to make sure that your calculator worked right. So, feed them their data this data and basically find out whether you get 386.7 or not. And over here in the standard deviation, you should get 23.06. Actually, that's the variance square, sorry. So the, the variance is 23. Therefore, the standard deviation is the square root of this, which becomes 4.8. All right? So that standard deviation also, huh? the bigger it is, the more the scattered the data is. But we will see once we know those distribution, and we assume that this population follow one of those distribution, a famous one called the Gaussian distribution. If we assume the data follow the Gaussian distribution, then this sigma would really mean something. It basically means that certain percentage of the data are guaranteed to be within plus or minus sigma. Huh? Right? But for now, it's a measure of how much the data is scattered around that average. Right? So now, uh, in the experiments, huh, or the events, for example, you know, you test a light bulb, working, not working, you get zero or one, or sometime you throw in a process, huh, and you can get one of those outcome, like a die. If you throw a die, you basically get one of six, right? Or if you are measuring something, you get different value depending on the sample. Say, let's say measure the tensile strength. So that, that the measurement would basically say, you know, 90, 40, 90, 50. So you get different number, not just a set. Okay? So that event, whether it's 1 or say 2 or 0, 4 or 5, 6, or basically just, you know, uh, odd or even, odd or even, huh? Democrat, Republic, Democrat, Republic. That event basically is bunch. Uh, is is uh, is part of a big sample. Sorry, a big uh, space S. Right. So A and B 
represent a set of the big space that we will have those events in. All right? So, for example, throwing the die, that A and B could be A is an even function, and B could be a number less than 4 when you throw. So an even, that means 2, 4, and 6. And less than 4, that basically means 2. And 1, and 3. Right? So the intersection is basically 2. Right? So when you have two events like this, A and B, then they could intersect. And we call this basically A intersect B. Right? And that would be something like this. And when we'd like to collect the two of them together, uh, sampling basically uh, the students, what are the chances that the student have a GPA higher than 3 and is also a uh, graduating senior. How many graduating seniors have a GPA 3 or higher? Right? So you are sampling the population leaving the door and basically those are how many are senior and how many senior with a GPA higher than 3. Okay. So that's basically the A union B when you'd like to collect all, how many total senior leaving the room and how many was higher than three, whether they are senior or not, right? So that would be A union B, okay? If they don't intersect, if this doesn't exist, that no, the class, the school is so tough, by the time you graduate, your GBE is guaranteed to have dropped less than three. No one leave with GBE higher than three then those two events will not intersect. Okay? And so we call them A and B are mutually exclusive. They don't really intersect. They don't have. This is important thing in when we do our statistics. If those events happen together or not. If they don't happen together, that's easier in the calculation. We don't have to worry about the chances of them happening together at the same time. All right? Like having A and 2 with one die. What are the chances of having one and two in one day? It doesn't happen, right? We're having an, odd, an even number together. It doesn't work. Those are mutually exclusive, all right? So anyway, so he, here, for example, that's the space for throwing a die with all the possible events, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And you can see here is basically having a number higher than, I guess, four. And this is basically having an odd number. One, three, and five. And number higher than four, that's five and six. And so they intersect here. And if you want to get what are chances of having an odd number or, or a number higher than four, it will be the union. If it's or, it's the union. If I want an odd number and also it has to be bigger than four, then it's the intersection. So and mean intersection and or mean Union, right? And that's called the Venn diagram. Have you seen this before? Good. All right. So some some useful information is so A intersect AC. What's AC? That's the complement of A. It's basically anything but A, huh? So in a space like this, the complement of A is basically anything but A. All right. So for example, A is uh, the event of having a number higher than four. That's five and six. So one, two, three, and four, those are all basically A complement. All right? So obviously the complement A and A, they don't intersect by definition. And so their union is, sorry, the intersection is, is phi. Phi is a null set. It has, doesn't have anything inside. It's basically as if you are trying to say zero with a set. Huh? Then there is no intersection between them. And of course, the, the union of A and A complement is the whole thing, right? It's the S. And the same thing if it's more than two processes, if you just combine a lot of them, it's the A union B, union B, union C. Union C. And if you want to intersect a bunch of them, it's basically intersect of this with this and this. All right? It's basically. you have three of them, so the intersect of A and B and C would be this guy. Right? And if you have another one, even, something like this, it will basically be this guy. 
That's the intersect of B, C, B, C, and D. All right? Piece of cake. So, it follows from that definition of complement function that, or complement group is that, or complement set is that A union B complement. So, this is A union B, and the complement of A union B is basically this, anything outside A union B. It's also a complement intersection with B complement because you can imagine the complement A is basically everything around A and the B complement is everything around B. So when you intersect them, you get basically this, right? And it doesn't show up here in this graph, but what I'm trying to show here is everything except for this small place in the middle. What's that? That's A com intersect B complement. So it's uh, everything outside this place which also happen to be A complement, union B complement. All right? Questions? Um, when you have more than two, like, can you go back to that? I think it's on the previous slide. Okay, yeah. All right. Apologies. Good. So now let's talk about the probability of having an event of A in that space S. Right? So, of course, the probability of having uh, something in the S, that's one, because S is a whole set. Right? So, when I'm throwing a die, the, what is the probability of having a number? That's one. That's 100%. Every time I'm, it's not going to ever land on the tip. Right? Standing on the tip, waiting to, to fall, that will not happen. All right? And so the probability of having A is basically the number of points of A divided by the number of points of S. That's only when they are equally likely, like it's a fair die. So when it's a fair die, huh, what is the probability of having 1? One? 1 and 6. Okay. Now, if this die is broken or basically weighted a little bit toward the, the 6, and I tell you, you know, they put extra weight a little bit in this side, and I tell you what's the probability of having 6, you would say, well, actually, it's more than 1 over 6, because this die, it kind of almost go to 6. Right? So that's not a fair or not equally likely. Okay? So that's what he explained over here. So for a fair die, you should expect, basically, 1 over 6. All right? And so, for example, what is the probability of having 5 or 6? 5 or 6 that become... Right? And you feel that he basically added the probability of 5 and the probability of 6. All right? So all basically kind of the, was the union of the two sets. Right? The probability of even number, that's basically a set which have even number. That's having 2 or 4 or 6. He added again the 3 of these guys. 3 over 6. That so it's fifty percent that you will get uh, an even number. All right. So this is not probably this is called the frequency. It's not mine, but the guy left his phone next to me, so I'm gonna take a chance. Okay. See it. A light will work. Well, I don't like my work. So. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so the this is the frequency, okay? So the, the 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 absolute frequency of the event is basically the number how many times this thing will occur. The relative frequency is the number this of a happening divided by the total number of time. Right? So if we do it a lot, huh? This rate of frequency become the probability, it become 1 over 6. If we keep throwing this die over and over and over, and we keep counting how many times, what's the rate of probability of having 1, it will end up being 1 over 6. So All right? Hold on. So the absolute frequency is the number of times it lands on A. Right. A That's A. F. And F relative is basically how many oh. times did you, how many times did you get A divided by how many times did you try this? So eventually this, F relative eventually become your uh, the fair probability that you should expect at the end. 
But if you throw it once or twice, it will not really happen. Right? And again, if A and B are mutually exclusive, they are independent of each other, they don't happen together, what is the point of having five? Huh? Zero. Wait, wait. Five or six? A union B, it's F relative A plus F relative B. Right? You're adding the two of them together. Okay, that's uh, again assuming that A and B are exclusive, mutually exclusive. All right? So, so this is the probability of having any event A that happened in that space S is going to be between 0 and 1. Minimum is zero and the maximum is one, right? And the probability of having something in that domain S is 100%, it's one, right? Probability of having an S, that's the whole thing. That's one, okay? And th with this relation, we will have another one for it when they are some intersection, when actually they would depend, they could happen together, or they are not mutually exclusive. But if they are, the probability of having a Huh? or B, A union B, is basically probability of A plus the probability of B. Correct? And that's not just for two events, that's for a lot of events. Okay? What's the probability of having one, two, and three? It's probability of having one plus the probability of having two plus the probability of having three. You are just keep adding them because the chance of having one of them doesn't really affect the other one. So... I just need to take note on this. What's the difference exactly between union and intersection? So union, they basically are saying A union B, it's A or B. That works. Huh? A or B. Right. So that's it's as if basically I will give you an extra uh, a free homework. Huh? Whether there is uh, a junior or a senior coming here. So that's basically union A union B so when the event come and you get junior or senior you still win that the event called as get recorded as success right okay. so let's assume that we have a fair chance of having freshman sophomore junior senior so that's a 50 percent probability one over four plus one over four Right, that the next students will be junior or senior. So it's kind of like yeah. Then th that's that will not work in that example because just like the die, those things cannot happen together. You cannot be a junior and a senior at the same time. You cannot have one and two at the same time. But we w when we will see what's the rule for two proceeds that could happen together, we will will give an example. Okay, it would be. I will only give you a free homework problem if the student is junior and he is also having a GBA 4 out of 4. That would be the intersection. Okay. So there's no chance. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So let's 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 <laughs> focus let's focus on mutually exclusive event now. They don't have them together. All right. So you are running a garage, huh? And cars come to change oil and stuff and fix things. And sometimes you get ten to twenty cars per day. Sometimes you get twenty-one to thirty cars per day. Sometimes you get thirty-one to forty. Sometimes you get even more than forty. Not that many days, but some days you get. All right, more than 40 that to visit. And you, you did this calculation huh, throughout the year. How many this event happened? How many? Not that any, the number of cars per day, those are mutually exclusive events. Because you cannot have, and so that, that's what you need to decide on the homework and in the exams. Whether those events are mutually exclusive or not. Can they happen together or they don't happen together? So you cannot have a, car, a number of cars visit per day between 10 and 20 and also between 21 and 30. It's either you got huh, 20 or you got 21. Either go to that box or that box. Right? So he did this last month, for example, and he sampled all the population last month. And based on that, 
he figured out that the probability for this is 0 0.2, 0 0.35, 0 0.25, 0 0.12. When you add all those population or those probabilities, you should get one. That's the probability of the S, the whole thing. The whole S domain, right? So now he's saying, he's asking about, so the problem, don't look at the solution. The problem will be like this. What is, huh, what is the probability that in a, a certain day, what? I'm saying he, he's, like, he's missing 8%. It, that's between uh, 10 to 0. So, <laughs> the question is this, what is the probability that the garage get at least 21 cars? At least 21 cars. So at least 21 cars, that means from 21 to higher. So what he's asking about, he's asking about the probability of, if let's call those event A, B, C, and D. He's basically asking for the B, union, C, union, D. Excellent. And we add this and this and this. We add the probability of 35, 25 plus 0.12. It's 0.72. Right? Those can be on the test too. Huh? Those can be on the test too. Yes. Just, just add them. You said you could like add a problem like this? Yeah, this is sure. Yes. Yes. That's, yes. that's good. And if you do problems like this, you could have 10 or 20 questions on the final right. exam. <laughs> Don't give him an idea now. All right, don't give him ideas. Okay, guys, so you just basically add those because those are mutually exclusive. Good. All right, so that's where we are. Okay, so the, the probability of not having A is 1 minus the probability of having A. Correct? Makes sense. Of course. All right. So now... The probability of having A plus A union B, uh, let's look at this. So what is the probability of getting an odd number or a number less than four? So now those two events, an odd number and a number less than four, are those mutually exclusive or they can happen together? They can happen together. And so the probability of having A or B is probability of A plus B minus probability of A intersect B. Okay? So if this example here were the number of car visit per day, but also we have the number of number of red colors visiting us, a number of red blue color visiting us, a number of gray color cars visiting us. Those, and then I tell you what's the probability of having 21 or higher, huh? And red cars, then you basically have, they could actually intersect, those events could intersect. All right, so here is the basically the probability of having an odd number and also number less than four. So we have to actually say minus this, all right? So probability of having an odd number, we know it, it's a fair die. And so it's 3 over 6. The probability of having a number less than 4, uh, that's 1, 2, and 3. And it's 3 plus 6. Minus the probability of having A intersect B, a number that's also odd and less than 4. So odd and less than 4, that's 1 and 3. So that what are the probability of 1 and 3? That's one third. 2 over 6. Right, so 3 over 6 plus 3 over 6 minus 2 over 6. You get this. Okay, so if the event happen together, you, you say minus the intersect, probability of the intersect. Because basically, you, what I say over here is that you don't want to count this twice. Right? You don't want to count it twice. But if they never happen together, there is no worrying about having and counting them twice. Very good. This is even uh, a little bit harder. And that is when you sample with replacement or you don't sample with replacement so when I'm trying to basically throw this die and I'm saying what's the probability of having odd number and odd number and I'm throwing twice 
So sewing it once, huh? The pretty fitting mode number, that's three over six. Sewing it again, because the, the first result didn't really affect the second results, right? But if I am having a deck of cards and I'm pulling one, and saying, what's the pretty of having an odd number? So you pull the first one and it's odd. The chances that you are pulling the second one and it's also odd now is not really uh, 50%. It has, the, it has changed and it probably decreased, right? Okay. So when, when we are saying the, when we are assembling with, with replacement, it's the probability of having two odd numbers now become BA time BB. So when I'm showing the dice twice, I'm saying what is the probability of having, huh? you're in the factory and you're showing your client the, your product, and there's a chance you have a, you are running a crabby factory, and there's a chance every time you pull a product, 10% of the time, this thing will get, will be broken, right? So what are the chances, you know, that you pull two pieces and they're all broken? Right? So the guy would leave. I mean, you pulled two samples and it's always broken. So it's, it's going to be BA and BB. Right? So that's if you pull this broken one and then you put it back in again and you're trying to sample another one. So that's with replacement. You are always pulling from the same pool. It's 10% times 10%. But if you're going to, you are not replacing it, you pull this thing and say, forget about it. Okay, let's now. Let's try and uh, again. It's going to be something like this. It's called BA and B of B without A. And we will see how we calculate this. Okay? But that's the probability of having B huh? without A happening. Okay? So, this is called conditional uh, probability. All right? So the, this probability is called condition probability of B given A. So the f given that A is already broken, and uh, what is the chances of getting this event B? All right? Given that I already the first card is odd, what is the probability of B? That the second card is a queen. Uh, well, it really depends. Do you count a queen as an odd or an even? Let's forget about the queen, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what is the risk of having an odd number? And the second is basically a uh, seven, all right? After I build the first one as an odd, what is the chance of the second one is actually seven? Depends if you pull seven, because a seven is an odd number. Right, that's, that's a good point. So that's why the, it's basically, it depends on whether you are replacing this card again or not. If you are replacing this card again, you start again with a, a, a fair chance and it's just multiplying B A and B B. But if you are not replacing, if you're already assuming A is happening and we will keep it, then this is the way to do it. It's B intersect B, probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of A. All right? And actually to prove it, you actually, you can prove it backward. You can prove that this huh, is actually this. It's much easier to actually do that. Right? But that's how we're going to calculate this probability. Alright? Probability of B given A. Alright? So again, we, we did this multiplication only if they are independent of each other. Only if we replace. If we put back again the sample and then we are throwing this second event again and the two events are completely independent from each other. But if you pull the card and you keep it, of course, the second card is not independent of the first one. It depends on, did you pull an odd number? Now I have lists, odd number in my deck. Did you already take the bad sample and you keep it away? Now I have less chance of getting pulling another bad one. But if you put back again the bad one, it's going to increase, all right? Okay, so an independent event basically you can just uh, multiply the probability time next to each other. All right? So I actually wanna we'll, we'll get examples 
Well, actually, let's do this example and switch to the statistics. All right? So, so a box contains 10 screws, three of which are defective. All right? Three out of the 10 are defective. Two screws are drawn, ra drawn at random and find the probability that neither of the two screws are defective. You're just like, what is the chances we can get away from that inspection and he will never find uh, the bad screw and we will get the deal. Okay? So, the, 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 the first event that draw a screw that's non-defective and then the second event is basically the screw is also non-defective. All right? And so without replacement, that's this. And with replacement, if you put it back again, it's basically this. Right? So without replacement, chances are we have to do it without replacement. I mean, what is, if we are putting it for an inspection, you know, here, see, it's not defective. Let's put it again and let's pull. No, why? Let's give me another one. Are you are really that desperate that you think? <laughs> so. AQL sampling? Huh? Do you know AQL sampling? No, not really, no. It's supposedly a number. They give so you, you some. You have 1 to 10,000 parts. Okay. And from like 1 to 50, if you pull this number, that's the least number of parts you should be able to pull with the best chance of finding a defective part in that range. I was wondering if there was some variation. Of so they give you a little bit of tolerance limits to... Yeah, because like if you're pulling 3,000 parts and you pull 10 of those and do a random inspection on them, supposedly that number is supposed to give you at least one bad yeah, part. Like if, you, if you have any defective, it's the minimum number to find it. It's right. The minimum right. Problem, you know, we, we, will, we will do something called confidence level in the results in the, in the next chapter. Maybe it will ring a bell. And eventually something called quality control, which basically tell you when you start seeing variation of data, is this a kind of a, a random error or not something serious and you have to stop the production line. Process error. All right. So we'll, we'll see this and then you can ask that question one more time. Okay. So again, uh, we would like to calculate the, the probability without uh, replacement, okay, and the probability with replacement. Right? So, with replacement, so first of all, the, the first one is 7 out of 10 because we know 3 are bad, right? So, the chance of having a, 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 a clean one, a non defective one, is 7 out of 10. All right? And with replacement, if we boot it back again and we pull the second one, it's still 7 out of 10. And so, the probability of having those two events, because they are with replacement, because they are independent of each other, it's this multiplied by this, 0.7 times 0.7. All right? Correct? That's basically this, when they are independent from each other. It's basically this, when we are sampling with replacement. We bring, put it back again, and then the second event is completely independent of what happened in the first one, whether it's effective or not. You had 70% chance in the first run, you will still have 70% in the second run. All right? Now, with replacement, it will be something like this. Okay? And so, here's, the, here's the, the logic for it. The first one is 7 out of 10. All right? And if A occurred, if A is already non-defective, now we actually have 9 screws, 3 of them are bad. Right? So the chance to pull a good one is 6 over 9, not 7 over 10 anymore. All right? And so those things happening together, probability of A and the probability of B given A, that A has happened, is basically 7 over 10 multiplied by 2 over 3. So it's 47%. Okay? So you are in good shape, better shape, basically telling him, can we please bring, put this back again and pull? Because you get 49% compared to 47%. And the difference get bigger and bigger as the number of bad samples get higher and higher. All right? Okay, so I will leave this for next class. Permutation and combination. We'll do that next time. And I want to jump to this.
so 25 random variable and probability distribution so this is the events basically throwing a die and counting well, I mean looking at the number so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 again in a fair die the probability of having one of those events is 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 6 alright so that's called the uh, frequency distribution function uh, what, how, how does the frequency of every event distribute over the events 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 6 right over here this is basically an event that's the summation of two random events so I, I would call a fair die a random event right the fact that I'm going to get three or four that's completely random okay what you will hear right now is actually a secret that mathematicians keep from us Okay, it's, it's a really, it has a very uh, important application in, in engineering and science. And so that secret is that any process that is a summation of random processes uh, is, gener will generate, when you sample that big process that's a summation of random processes, it's guaranteed to generate a Gaussian distribution right so it, the process has to be a summation of other events and those events need to be random right like for example imagine if you're uh, the students for example grade in, in every course is completely random you know <laughs> it's just luck they, they don't do exam actually we just flip coins <laughs> if we flip coins and then decide what's your grade based on that coin and we sample the, your GBA of the different students at the end of the of graduation, they will follow a Gaussian distribution, right? That's the principle behind six sigma. And if if the process is a multiplication of events, huh? So this go into a multiplication, like kind of a, a signal get basically mag magnified and get to go to another process which get magnified. They get end up multiplying by each other. The distribution will become not Gaussian, but the log of the process become Gaussian. So we call it, rather than normal distribution, that's the normal distribution, the Gaussian distribution, the bell shape distribution. It will be the log normal distribution. So that the, not the event, but log the event is normal. Okay? And that's, that's important in fluid mechanics, for example. So all the turbulence, huh? You can actually think that the, the some of the the, the 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 randomness is due to multiplication of events, and so it would be log normal rather than normal. Okay, but this is pretty useful, all right? So, and actually, you can see that if you add this is what this is a chance of let's throw two die and add them together. That's and it's completely random. The event of each one of this thing is equally distributed, 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 6. So when you figure out, so what are the chances of getting 12? That's only if you get 6 and 6. So if you get 6 and 6, and the 2 die, that's basically 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6. So you get basically this. But what are the chances of getting, say, 7? Well, I can get 7 by 1 and 6, 2 and 5, 3 and 4, Right? So when you start adding all those things, you end up with a Gaussian distribution. Alright? So throwing and one so throwing one die twice to get the same number of things, like say six, is multiplication, so you have a one in thirty six chance of getting twelve. So if you throw the, the event has to be it's basically your you should sample the multiplication of the two die, not the summation. If you sample the summation of the two die, you should get a Gaussian distribution. But if you sample the multiplication of the two die, the multiplication of the two number, you will find that you have a log normal distribution. Okay? Let's let's focus for the summation because what that's what this is about. This is about the summation of two random processes. If you add them, you should get a Gaussian. But you should make sure that those processes are actually random. Right? So the the die doesn't always peak at six, for example, for whatever reason. Right? So now, 
this is the, the frequency of each one of this event, right? Each one of this event. And we give the small f. There is a capital F function. And this is basically kind of the cumulative distribution function. Let's add this guy. So in this book, he called this the probability function. The small one is the probability function f of x. And the big one is the distribution function, capital F of x. Other books and most engineering problem, they basically call this the probability distribution function, the small f, yes, that's the probability distribution function, and the capital F, that's the cumulative distribution function. It's basically adding all the small f. So what is it? It's basically, you know, what is the events one, two, three, four, five, and six, all right? So capital F of x is basically the probability of having this or anything lower than it. The max or anything lower, of course it's one. Right? And how do you get that? You add, basically. You add, what's the probability of having two or anything smaller than it? It's this plus this. It's two. What's the probability of having three or anything less than it? It's basically, let's add those guys. All right? So the cumulative distribution function, the capital F, let's call it capital F and small f, so that we wouldn't really uh, confuse you with the, with the nomenclature in this book. The difference between the capital F and the small f is the capital F is the addition of all those guys. It's basically eventually go to one, always. At the max, maximum number, whatever this number is, capital F would be 12. And the meaning is, what is the chance of having this guy or anything smaller than it? And it's one. And you get it by adding it. All right? So does every process in the world follow a Gaussian distribution? No. There are different distributions that are not really uh, Gaussian, the wind energy. Uh, if we sample the wind on the top of this building every day of the year, and we end up, I mean, record what's the average every day, and then put them in a table, and then solve them, find the minimum and maximum, divide them into bands, and plot the distribution, it's not Gaussian. There is cert it's called wobble distribution. They found out that this wobble distribution, uh, which is not Build shape, but it's different thing. Really, it's very well for the wind. If I work in a coal power plant, and we crunch the the coal before we send it to the furnace so that it would burn, and we sample the size of the of the coal particle, are they going to be Gaussian? No, that process, you know, is not the event of. It's not like we just go to the field and pick completely random cool particles. No, we crunch them and there is a process to crunch them and that it turned out no distribution is rosen rambler There is different distribution that that match different processes, all right? But what I'm saying is that if it's completely random and we are adding, it's completely random, we should get a flat curve like this, right? That's the distribution of having head or tail. But the, the addition Huh? is basically will end up being something else. Okay, good. And so that's that. This is to prove to you that it's gonna be Gaussian. He's basically showing, showing here's the uh, adding two third die, all right? And here are the number, and you can check on him if you don't believe him, all right? And basically, this this is a Gaussian distribution, all right? So, actually, out of this thing, if you want to say what is the probability of having those two die between 5 and 10, that I end up with a number between 5 and 10, the addition. So I'm not talking about this, I'm talking about this. What is the probability of having a number between 5 and 10 on the, t on the face of the two die? Huh? Between 5 and 10, not just 5 or 10. What's the probability of having a number between 5 and 10? Right? It's let's add this plus this plus this plus this plus this. Yeah, I, I was talking about the second graph. Right. So between five and ten over here. Yeah. Right. So it's actually if in this in this graph you add those guys, right? That's between five and ten. In this graph, it's basically let's read this number at ten, and let's read this number at five, and then subtract. subtract. 
right? Because the number at 10, that's basically say anything less than 10, 10 or less. Number at 5, that's 5 or less. The probability of having 5 or less. So between them, it's basically, let's make F minus F. Capital F minus capital F. Does this make sense? <coughs> what is capital F again? The probability of having the number or smaller. So what is the probability of having a number between less than 12? That's 1. 12 or less, it's 1. What's the probability of having a number between 12 and 10? You'd have to say basically it's the 1 minus the probability of having 10 or less. And that would be the between 12 and 10. Okay, it's basically this rule. All right? So the, the small f, if it's random, it would be Gaussian. If it's not, this is the log normal. I'm trying to put the log normal for you. It looks like this, actually. It kind of have a really long tail. Okay? One of my, one of my students, he actually, his master degree was to basically study the sprays in, of a scramjet engine and figure out what is the best distribution that describe them. And so it turned out that, of course, it's not Gaussian, right? But he went through other distribution, too, rosen Rumler and... Uh, in the root normal distribution, and he found that actually log normal is really very good for describing the, the spray sizes. They don't come at one size, they come at different sizes. When they break out of the injector, they are not all, you wish they are always just one size, but no, they come with complete. And sometimes you have something like this. That distribution basically have two... More of one size or more of the other size. Right, have basically two peaks, right? Two moods. So you may end up with a distribution like this. All right? Very good. So what he's trying to say is that if we add all the small f over here, we should get 1, right? If we add all the small f, we should get 1. So when, when that frequency distribution is bar chart, you just add them. When that distribution is a function, I will give you the function for the Gaussian in a second. So it's not individual number, it's actually a continuous function. Huh? Function of x, function of the diameter, function of the, the income. What's the probability of, I don't know, the probability of your saving as function of your income, your saving as function of income percentage-wise, like how much you save as a function of your income. Okay? If your income is really small, you don't save anything. If your income is really big, you don't save anything. You just don't care. You spend all of it, and so... So... So it could be a function of the, the variable x. So if it's this case, rather than adding all of it, and we should get 1, it's integrating all of it, and you should get 1. So when it's continuous function like this, the integration of small f from minus infinity to infinity is 1. And when I'm saying from minus infinity to infinity, obviously I mean the over the valid domain. I mean there's no point when I'm throwing 2 die to go beyond 12, right? Or going less than 0. It will not happen less than 0, it will not happen more than 12. But say the, the probability of your, say, income Sorry, your credit card debt. It could be negative, right? So anyway, so in, in this case, now the capital F would basically be the, the area under the curve, right? So the probability of having between A and B, or capital, B, capital F B minus capital F A, would basically be this area under the curve because the whole area under the curve is 1 and the capital F of B is basically B or lower it's all the area from B and going this way that's capital F of B capital F of A is basically all this part it's what it was the addition of all the small f all the way up to this point it's as if here it's the integration of all this until you hit that point good Good. So that's why the capital F is the small f, integration of small f, all the way from minus infinity up to 
that x that you are trying to get the f of x. So the f of a is the integration from minus infinity to a, the integration from minus infinity to a, all this place. You got that? Good. So when we had a bunch of numbers and we wanted the average, we added them and divide over the total. When we end up with a bar chart, a frequency like this, huh? or like this, and we would like to get the average, we cannot just add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus, actually in this case, we okay, can, but in this case, <coughs> like here, I cannot just add 1 plus 2. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this because they have the same probability. That's why I can, but just how you get a distribution. So in here, I cannot, to come up with the average, I cannot just say, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus and divide over 12. No, what we need to do is this. X multiply by F. The box label, the BIM label, multiply by its probability. F. Okay, so if I have a, a chart like this, uh, say 20% here, 40% over here, and uh, what's left? 60? No. So 30 and 30. 30, 30 and 40, and this happened at 1, 2, and 3. And I would like to come up with the average. What should I do? 3 times 1 plus 1, 4 times 2 plus 0.3 times 3. 1 multiplied by? 0.3 plus 2 multiplied by 0.4 plus 3 multiplied by 0.3 where those were a percentage. Okay? That would be the x average. See how I didn't add 1 plus 2 plus 3 and divide it over the number because they are not the same weight. Alright? So this is how you do it in the bar chart. And if it was a probability function, if you were given the curve, if you were given the curve, huh? if I give you this f of x, and I'm asking you for the average, what do you do? Just like when we said sigma of small f, x i, f of i, this become this, <coughs> the integration. So it's x, f, dx. So why is that? Because the, the probability, imagine if this line is so thin. You should think about this function, this probability function is basically a bunch of small bars. Each one of those bars represents the probability of having this x. Okay, what is the thickness of that thing? It's dx, because it's so thin, and it's high to the fx. So out of Simpson rule, remember the integration? The volume or the area of that small box is f of x dx. That's the area of that box. Multiply by x and doing the summation, and it become like this. All right? So this is important because any time I give you any function, f of x, and I ask you for the average, you just hit it with an x and you multi you integrate. Gaussian, Rosen, Rambler, any distribution. If you want to get the, the average, huh? or the mean, now it's a mean because uh, it's a continuous function, just x, f of x, and, and those are the equivalent formula for basically the variance. So again, This was for discrete functions, okay? And this is for uh, continuous function. X minus the mean square f of x, right? Good. So in a Gaussian, the mean is actually going to be the peak. That makes sense. It's in the middle. But for a log normal or anything else, the mean is not always the, the highest point. The highest point is actually the most probable point, huh? That's like the mood of the distribution. But it's not 
So it happened a lot of time. It has the highest probability. Every time you check, just like you will get this guy. But that's not the mean because the, the long tail, for example, the non-symmetry in the curve. All right? So I want to finish in the last minute by this. This is the Gaussian distribution. All right? So this function is given by this equation. What are the two variables in it? So it's actually a function of x. The two parameters here are mu and sigma. Mu is the average, and sigma, that's the standard deviation. All right? So if the mean is like, say, 3, you should expect the Gaussian distribution when you plot it to basically be here, around 3. That's the, that's the mean. And with a smaller standard deviation, you should see something like this. And with bigger standard deviation, you should see something like this. So the bigger the standard deviation, the more spread this curve is. The smaller standard deviation, it will itself until it's like, you know, a spike on extreme cases, for example. Right? That, that's the extreme. That's really, really extreme case. All right? But that's basically the Gaussian distribution or the normal distribution. Right? Because that's what normally you expect when the process is summation of random events. And we'll finish by this. Thank you.